Thank you. We've been discussing at these lunches for almost a year now concerns about the multilateral talks with Iran, the, the P5 plus one talks, P5, the five permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany. But this discussion is different because we're now in the end game. The talks are facing a November 24th deadline. The Obama administration is rushing towards the end zone, worried about a Republican Senate in January. They want to deal very badly. So we're, fo we're faced now with the question, how, what kind of deal we're going to get, how bad is it going to be, and how should we respond? And that's what I want to talk about right now. It looks likely that we are going to get a very weak deal that may only, may only last less than 10 years. But I don't think what's understood by the American public, what's not being reported by the media, is how incredibly dangerous this deal is and the concessions that were made by the Obama administration to get us where they are. And, and there's, there's a couple right now that are really extraordinary that are, that are worth talking about to explain where we are. Two weeks ago, the administration floated a proposal to allow Iran to operate all but about 1,500 centrifuges, which it's using to enrich uranium to reactor grade, if it would disconnect the rest of its centrifuges. It has about 19,000 of them. That's about enough to make 2.5 nuclear weapons worth of low enriched uranium per year. And the argument was if the piping between the centrifuges was disconnected on all but 1,500, the international community could swoop in quickly if it looked as if Iran was making a dash towards a nuclear weapon. Um, there's a lot of problems with that because Iran could quickly reconnect the centrifuges. And um, this also is based on the false assumption that has been at the, that has been at the foundation of these talks is that reactor-grade uranium is not that dangerous. The administration did convince Iran to stop enriching uranium to the 20 percent uranium-235 level. Uh, most of its uranium, about seven nuclear weapons worth, in terms of low and rich uranium. Uh, Iran has been allowed to keep since an interim deal was agreed to last November, and there are different interpretations on, on what will be done with that in, in a permanent agreement, but it's pretty clear that uranium is not going to leave the country. So the idea that Iran would only have 1,500 centrifuges, they may be enriching less, but they still have this large stockpile of reactor-grade uranium that a, a variety of organizations have said would only take Iran from three to six weeks to convert into its first nuclear weapon in hi highly enriched uranium fuel. Um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be a number of months or years, which the administration is asserting. They could do this fairly quickly. Well, it looks like this proposal was not good enough for the Iranians, so another proposal came out. I think it was early this week. Iran can operate up to 3,500 centrifuges if it would agree to convert any uranium it produces into what was described as uranium powder, probably uranium dioxide. The reason they gave is that if uranium is converted into uranium dioxide, it will take Iran a year to convert it back into uranium hexafluoride, which is the feed for these centrifuges, and, and then it could be, hence, further enriched to, to, to weapons grade. False again. False again. It will only take Iran about two weeks to reconvert uranium dioxide back into a form it could further enrich to weapons-grade uranium. And so basically, both of these statements are, are based on um, claims, scientific claims or policy claims that were misleading, if not outright false. Let me tell you another one, and that concerns the Iraq heavy water reactor. Iraq is spelled A-R-A-K. In the interim deal last year, the Obama administration claimed that the deal stopped this reactor from operating, and they will use the final agreement to stop Iran from using this reactor to make plutonium, which is, which is a far better fuel than highly enriched uranium because it has a lower critical mass, which means you need substantially less of it to make a nuclear weapon uh, than, than uh, highly enriched uranium. None of this was true. Under the interim deal, the Iranians were allowed to continue to work on the Iraq reactor, which was a, a major change from the past when the West had insisted that this reactor must be shut down. I mean, efforts to stop it must halt. Iran cannot have a plutonium producing reactor. We're now engaged in discussions 
on how to change this reactor so it will produce less plutonium. So Iran will be allowed to have this reactor. Now, there's two ways it can be adapted, and I've, I've discussed this before. It can be retooled as a light water reactor. That would be difficult to reverse for Iran. Or it can be fueled with low enriched uranium, which would result in less plutonium in the spent fuel rods, but that move is easily reversible. Iran doesn't want to make any changes to this react reactor, but the only uh, change it has expressed interest in is the low enriched uranium fuel route, which would be a joke. It would do nothing to stop the threat from this reactor, and frankly, I think it is simply inviting Israel to take it out. The idea uh, that we're even considering letting Iran have a reactor that will produce substantial amounts of plutonium. And, and plutonium is so important for making missile warheads, for making cruise missiles, for making suitcase bombs. Iran cannot have a source of plutonium, period. That has been the position of administrations, this administration, until I guess the fall of last year. And it almost stopped the talks from going forward. Then we've had Iranian cheating and lack of cooperation. <clears throat> the first bout of cheating occurred even before the current round of talks began in February. According to the interim agreement that set up the talks that was agreed to last November, Iran was not allowed to set up advanced centrifuges. And before we finalized the agreement in January, Iran was not only caught designing advanced centrifuges, but had installed some. This delayed the start of the talks for several weeks. So, so what was agreed to? We agreed that Iran could continue to install and research advanced centrifuges that they already were researching as of January 2014. Now, this is a big deal because most of Iran's centrifuges are called the IR-1 design. They're very primitive. They tend to break down. They're not very efficient. The advanced centrifuges are up to four times faster and far more efficient. They're allowed to replace centrifuges with advanced ones. So if we let Iran have 3,500 centrifuges and they've replaced them with centrifuges that are four times faster, they're actually going to have more production capacity than they have today using the primitive machines given the breakdown rate. But it gets worse. In February, just after the talks began, reports came out that Iran is researching something called the IR-8, its most advanced centrifuge yet, which will be 16 times more efficient than its IR-1 centrifuges. Now, Iran has, has escaped the te – Iran has only technically violated the terms of the agreement by not testing these centrifuges by, in, by in, uh, injecting them with uranium hexafluoride. They're basically running mechanical tests. But why does Iran need a centrifuge that's 16 times more efficient for a peaceful nuclear program? Uh, it, it, it is simply if, – if you talk to diplomats, they simply say, well, centrifuge designs, that's a complicated issue. Well, it's very complicated because it, it, it basically is, it, is an example of Iran at least showing bad faith, if not violating what this agreement stands for. Another major concern deals with weaponization. There's three legs to making a nuclear weapon. Nuclear fuel, that's the most difficult, difficult one. Uh, there's making the warhead, which is, which is difficult, not as difficult as nuclear fuel. And then there's delivery systems. The talks are not touching delivery systems at all. Despite the fact that Iran has tested at least three long-range rockets, which it claimed were for lifting satellites, but most experts believe were actually long-range missile tests. And the IAEA has documents that indicate clearly that Iran has engaged in testing that appears to be related to the development of a nuclear warhead. Iran will not answer these documents. It says that they're a forgery. Iran is required by the interim deal to answer a series of questions about weapons-related work, not just the construction of a nuclear warhead, but other things that seem to have military applications, according to the IAEA. The IAEA came out with a report last month, and it explained very clearly that Iran has not answered any of these questions. Iran is also refusing to let the IAEA inspectors into certain facilities where we are sure weapons-related work was conducted, including a, a military base called Parchin, where it's believed they had conducted explosive testing to develop nuclear warheads. <clears throat> so, so where does this leave us? I mean, you've probably heard a lot of this. We're, we're lunging towards a deal. What does this add up to? We've seen a process where the Obama administration has said, well, okay, you've heard bad things. 
The interim deal was bad, but the interim deal was just a first step towards a stronger final agreement. That's not what we've seen. We've seen bad concession after bad concession to such a, to such a point where we're going to get a weak deal that will have a very short uh, um, time horizon, after which Iran will be given a clean bill of health. We agree to, in the interim deal, that there will be a, a sunset clause. The Iranians want this deal to last 10 years or less. We're calling for it to last in the teens. After that time, Iran will be allowed to engage in any activities it wants, any nuclear activities it wants, as long as it tells the IAEA, including building an unlimited number of centrifuges and an unlimited number of plutonium-producing reactors. The, cent the, the, the sunset clause is something the administration is very nervous about. They don't want to talk about it. But as bad as this deal is, it won't even last very long, which I think is a big, uh, a big problem. So the way I would summarize this is that until the spring of 2012, the Obama administration's position, their approach to the Iranian nuclear program basically was the same as the Bush administration's. How do we stop Iran from getting the bomb? Since last November, it's been clear that their policy now is, how long can we stop Iran from getting a bomb? And how many bombs will we let them build? There's simply no other conclusion one can come from these proposals. What they're proposing will not stop Iran from producing enriched uranium. It will not stop Iran from producing plutonium. It will not stop Iran from building delivery systems. This is a proposal that will basically allow Iran to continue its pursuit of nuclear weapons. So what I'm proposing <clears throat> and what the Center for Security Policy is proposing is that Congress has to stop this deal. Congress must renounce this deal because this deal will cause instability in the Middle East. It could lead to a nuclear arms race in the Middle East because the Saudis and other nations may start developing nuclear weapons. We know Iran is developing long-range missiles that could hit the United States possibly as soon as next year, according to a recent Defense Department report. Congress must, on a bipartisan basis, renounce these talks and renounce a final agreement if one is produced by late November, which I, I think is likely. I might add that Congressman Pete Hoekstra thinks the agreement will be signed before Election Day. I, I'm, I don't agree with him on that, but I want to add that because uh, Mr. Hoekstra is a pretty smart guy. The talks must be renounced, and san sanctions must be placed on Iran to make them abide by six Security Council re resolutions, which it's violating, <clears throat> by pursuing a plutonium-producing reactor, by enriching uranium, and by not cooperating with the IEA. Basically, Congress has to reestablish a responsible policy on the Iranian nuclear program, because this administration has abdicated that responsibility. In my opinion, Someday there will be a nuclear deal with Iran, and both sides are going to have to give up something. And I want a deal like that. But that agreement will have to substantially set back or halt the, the Iranian nuclear program, and it has to last at least 20 years. That, that's, my, that's my grounds. Set back or halt has to last 20 years. We are nowhere near that standard under, under this administration. And I believe what they've negotiated is so awful we can't trust them to go any further. And I therefore think it's a responsibility for Congress to take control of the situation, to pass tough sanctions. And if they pass tough sanctions, Iran will back out, saving us from ourselves. You might add, how can we get past the President's veto? Um, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, how can, how can we reverse a deal that the, the President is not submitting for uh, ratification by the Senate? This is not a treaty. Um, that's one way, because Iran will back out if we pass sanctions. Concerning a possible presidential veto, last December we almost had a veto-proof majority for sanctions that were put forward by Senators Menendez and Kirk. I think this deal is so awful that when the American people in Congress understand what's in it, we could get a bill that is veto-proof, maybe in December, maybe in January, in a new Congress, that can undo this monstrosity. So, so. Thank you very much, Fred. That's um, quite a grim picture you're painting. Um, let me ask uh, one question quickly first here, and then we'll open it up to the uh, rest of you for questions. Absent um, 
any apparent um, U.S. leadership uh, from our Department of State, from our White House, to oppose the deal that you outlined that's so awful and does seem to be taking shape, is there any likelihood that other members of the P5 plus one um, would be reluctant to uh, go forward with an agreement or would pose objections to it, do you think? I'm hopeful that if our European allies see the strong congressional opposition, we might convince one of them to drag their feet. But so far, they have been completely deferential to U.S. representatives. This has basically been an Iran-U.S. negotiation. It's supposed to be multilateral, but it hasn't been. It's been the U.S. and Iran. But I'm, I have some hope that, that maybe they would recognize that this, if this deal isn't going to go through, maybe they won't uh, expend political capital to push for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Dan over here. I agree with you in your pessimism that there might very well be a deal and it will be unacceptable. If there isn't a deal, because one, one possibility is that the Iranians see that in the lack of a resolute uh, response in the absence of a deal, they may be able to achieve all of their objectives without placing limits on their behavior at all, and that the sanctions may kind of wither away in the near future under uh, that scenario. Would you talk for a little bit about if they don't reach an agreement, what the Iranian response is likely to be, and the probability that sanctions will remain in place, the, especially the European sanctions? Well, I didn't talk about the sanctions issue, but I'm glad that you brought that up. Sanctions have been substantially weakened over the last year to try to encourage the Iranians to cooperate. Uh, they received about $20 billion in sanctions relief to begin the talks. When the talks were supposed to end and they were resumed in, June, in, in July, they were given another $8 billion in sanctions relief. I think this administration is so desperate for a deal, what you're proposing is not going to happen. But I think it's possible that the talks might be postponed uh, uh, or might be extended past November. I don't think that's likely. I think, they want, I think the Obama administration wants a deal before the end of this year. But it's possible maybe Iran is pushing for something unreasonable or, or maybe because of pressure from Congress, the administration pauses and tries to regroup. Um, in that scenario, I think the Iran, Iranians would continue to play the game they're, they're playing right now, continue to push for more and more uh, concessions by the West. One thing they're trying to do right now is they're trying to use their help against ISIS to leverage for an even better deal than we're already offering, which is really pretty incredible. Um, so anyway, I, I don't think that's likely, but it may be the talks might be extended. I saw a hand right next. Yeah, you have, go ahead, please. Uh, just for the record, the Wall Street Journal reports today that 350 members of Congress sent a letter to Kerry complaining about the way they're conducting their Iranian uh, negotiations. That's great news. I, and I think that's typical that there is bipartisan opposition to this. This isn't, a, this isn't a Republican issue. Senator Mendendez hates these talks. And I'm wondering after the election what might be possible to work out with him to get him to take a stand to say, you know, Mr. President, we have to go back to the drawing board. This isn't going to cut it. Uh, 350 is a, a large number. Sure, Dan, go ahead. And then we'll come Obviously, back. We've, been, we've been heavily involved in this. Just there are limits to what Senator Menendez has been willing to do, though. So you may remember last May, uh, Senator Corker proposed as a rider on the defense authorization bill that any agreement they reached would have to go to the Senate to be approved. And Senator Menendez cooperated with the administration mm -hmm. to prevent that from going forward. So as much as we've, we do like Senator Menendez and his stance on this issue, there are limits as to what certain, you know, the Democrats basically pushed him back into line and said this will be a political black eye for the president that we can't that, go. That's true, but there's two reasons for that. First of all, they're worried about the upcoming election, and they don't want to put their members in a difficult position. They don't want vulnerable de Democrats to vote against that because it, it would have been embarrassing. Uh, but second of all, Menendez, a lot of pressure was put on Men Menendez to give diplomacy a chance. I don't think he believed that, but I think both cards together gave him an opportunity. I'm hoping after the elections, when the result of the d diplomacy is apparent, I'm hoping we might be able to get a better position out of him. Yes, sir. 
I'm curious, what is it about a 20-year lifespan for a deal versus a 10-year lifespan that would make the 20-year acceptable but the 10-year not? Well, I was just trying to come up with some compromise term. I'd certainly like to see it last indefinitely if possible. But when we're talking 10 or less years, I think we're talking about a, 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 a timeline that is simply unacceptable given Iran's recent behavior. You know, I might add on that, uh, on that subject of the 10-year treaty, the 10-year limit on a treaty, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with something called the Treaty of Hudabiyah. The Treaty of Hudabiyah is a, a pact reached by Muhammad and the early Muslim forces um, with the, um, its enemies at the time, their enemies at the time at the, in, in, the, in the city of Mecca, which, which they wanted to conquer, but they didn't have the forces to be able to do it just at the time they, they, they wanted to do this, six, about 628, I think this was. And so what, what Muhammad did was uh, enter into a treaty with the leadership of the city of Mecca, and that treaty was set to be for 10 years. Now, in two years' time, he had gathered enough forces, about 10,000 men under arms, that he was able to break the treaty, march into the city of Mecca, and take it over, which is what he did. And from ever afterwards, 10 years is the absolute maximum that Muslim forces will enter into a treaty <coughs> with infidels. That is the, the standard, that is the doctrine. So whether, whether the uh, negotiators realize it or not, there is, there is some meaning behind that. And lest it be thought that I just, you know, I spend too much time, you know, reading the biography of Muhammad, um, it was earlier in this negotiation process, I think about last year, around a year ago or so, um, that uh, it was, uh, I think, the foreign minister, um, the Iranian foreign minister, made a comment uh, exactly to that, to that point when, when there was opposition among some uh, within Iran to the way that the treaty or the, the negotiations were going. Um, they thought they weren't getting uh, the best deal or whatever. And he said, uh, you know, take it easy. This is just a treaty of Hudabiyah. He actually said this. Long before, as soon as the forces were sufficient to, to, to obtain the objective, and, and that is the model for um, Iran, uh, uh, Islamic, any Muslim um, negotiations with infidels ever since. Little point of interest. Any more questions for Fred? Well, let me ask one last before we let you go, if you don't mind. Uh, and that is, I wanted to refer to the uh, speech by uh, uh, Israeli uh, Prime Minister Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu at the United Nations for the um, General Assembly speeches where he made a point of bringing our focus back uh, to Iran and uh, basically saying let's not forget in the midst of all this other chaos um, that, that Iran is still um, the, the, uh, the, the primary uh, threat out there certainly for Israel but also for the region and the United States. What what would you say, Fred, about um, the Israeli position? Why maybe that they have waited so long to actually do anything about the uh, Iranian nuclear weapons program? And what do you, what do you uh, think that the uh, Prime Minister was referring to? Or wh where was he going with that? That's a great question, Claire. Thank you. Uh, Netanyahu was great. Uh, the point I like most is why does Iran need uranium centrifuges for a peaceful program? They don't have the capability of making fuel rods. They can make rods for a research reactor, but they're making far more reactor-grade uranium than they would ever need for that reactor. Um, he just talked about there are nations with peaceful, na peaceful programs all over the world that do not have centrifuge programs. In his view, the centrifuges are clearly for weapons. I think he's absolutely right.